Hi, this is Rich Neapolitan. Today I will be talking about Bayesian networks. Recall that I mentioned before that in the 1970s, uh, researchers attempted to reason under uncertainty using the rule-based approach, and they developed certainty factors. I also mentioned there were a number of problems that were discovered with this approach. In the 1980s, uh, an, the Uncertainty in Artificial Intelligence Workshop was formed, and researchers from various fields attended it and argued about the best way to handle uncertainty. Glenn Schaefer argued for belief functions. Uh, Latvizada argued for using fuzzy logic and fuzzy set theory. Um, other people, Peter Cheeseman in particular, argued for the probabilistic approach. What emerged from all this was the field called Bayesian networks. Um, so I'm going to be introducing them today. They are somewhat they are the standard architecture for handling uncertainty in artificial intelligence and informatics. Recall this example we had before of these data, and we said that perhaps these data could be considered indicative of some population at large. And we noted that wage and height are not independent, that the probability of making 30,000 is one fourth but the probability of making 30,000 if you're only 64 inches tall goes up. It's bigger than this. Probably making 30,000 if you're medium height is one fourth, which is a base value. But the problem making if you're tall is, is zero. So tall people tend, tend to be less likely to make the, the smaller money, and it's not hard to see that tall people are more likely to make the bigger money. So, so wage and height are definitely not independent. But we showed that they are independent given gender. That once we know the person is female, the probability of making 30,000 was one half. If we condition on being a 64 inch female, it's still one half. If we condition on being a 68 inch female, it's still one half. And there are no 70 inch females in, in according to this. All right, so wage and height, although they are not independent, they are conditionally independent given gender. We write this like this, independent wage and height given gender. That's the notation I use to denote that these two are conditionally independent given gender. A Bayesian, we can represent the relationships among height, weight, and gender with a Bayesian network. It's a fairly simple Bayesian network, but it looks like this. Because height and wage are independent given gender, we draw, we created a directed acyclic graph called the DAG and draw edges from gender to height and gender to wage. Then for gender, we have its prior probabilities. The prior probability of a, the gender equals female is one half, the prior gender equals male is one half. For these variables, height and wage, we have their conditional probabilities given the value of their parents. The probability height equals 64, given gender equals female equals two thirds. You can see this from the previous uh, data set. Um, you can print off a copy of that if, if, you, if you like to continue in, in, with this uh, lecture. Probably H equals 68, given height equals female is one third. Probably height equals 70, given gender equals female is zero. These are the conditional probabilities of height given the two different values of gender. These are the conditional probabilities of wage given the two values of gender. This is a Bayesian network. A Bayesian network consists of a DAG and a conditional probability distribution of each variable in the DAG. If the variable is a root, it's the prior probability distribution. Now, here is a formal definition of a Bayesian network. Suppose we have a directed acyclic graph called a DAG whose nodes are random variables and a joint probability distribution of the variables in the DAG. Each node is conditionally independent of its non-descendants given its parents. This is essential. These conditional independencies have to hold for the probability distribution relative to the DAG. Then we say that the graph, the DAG, and the probability distribution satisfy the Markov condition. If each node is conditionally independent of its non-descendants, 
given its parents, by its non-descendants, we mean all those nodes that are either parents of it or, or descendants of parents of it. Then we say it satisfies the Markov condition, and we call the DAG and the probability distribution a Bayesian network. It is a theorem that a graph is a Bayesian network, then P is the product of its conditional distributions in G. And that means that P can be represented by those conditional distributions. So think about that example involving height, wage, and gender. We showed that height and wage are independent given gender. So that means if we draw that DAG with gender pointing to height and wage, um, then each variable is independent of its non-descendants given its parents. Height is independent of, of wage given gender. And therefore, it can be represented by the product of the conditional distributions. Now, I forwarded to this slide a little bit too early. Um, what is the value of a Bayesian network? Using a Bayesian network, we can represent a joint probability distribution of, of many variables very succinctly. <coughs> Suppose we have a, a situation like this. If the variables are binary and each variable has, has two parents like this, there are 2 to the 10th equal 1,024 values in the joint distribution. All right, because if there's 10 variables, each one can have any one of two values, there's 2 to the 10th possible values in the joint distribution. But you can see with a quick calculation, there's only 36 values in the conditional distribution. So an advantage of a Bayesian network is it can represent a, a, a very big joint probability distribution very succinctly. Right, the Bayesian networks can contain hundreds or even thousands of nodes, and the number of values in the joint probability distribution can be in the billions. But if there are, each variable does not have too many parents, we can represent those distributions pretty succinctly. For a given distribution, how can we find the DAG G such that G and P satisfy the markup condition? In the case of wage, height, and gender, I looked at the data first. All right, and you can, in fact, learn these distributions from data. All right, and I'm going to actually talk about that later on in, in the course. But another way to do it is people often argue that a causal DAG will satisfy the Markov condition. So if you draw a causal DAG, then you can assume that the assumptions for the Markov condition are satisfied. And so all you need to do then is to ascertain the conditional probability distributions, and you can be fairly confident that you will be representing the probability distribution correctly. Here's an example. Smoking can cause bronchitis and can cause lung cancer. Bronchitis and lung cancer each can make an individual fatigued, and lung cancer can cause a positive chest X-ray. Now, what I'm going to do is to talk about this example a little bit and show why if these are causal relationships intuitively we'd expect the Markov condition to be satisfied. All right. You would not think that fatigue is independent of smoking history. Now why would you not think this? Because if somebody smokes it makes it more likely they will obtain these diseases which are results of smoking and which it makes it more likely that they will be fatigued. So fatigue is not independent of smoking. All right, so people who smoke are more likely to be fatigued. Similarly, people are fatigued, they're more likely to have smoked because that's an explanation for being fatigued. But if I condition on the parents of bronchitis and lung cancer, and that's what the Markov condition says. If you condition on the parents of a variable, then that variable needs to be independent of its non-descendants, and its non-descendants are H and X, given those parents. So once I know that a patient has bronchitis and lung cancer, there's a probability of being fatigued. It's more likely. Finding out the person smokes doesn't increase that probability. It only increased that probability by making it more likely the person would have bronchitis or lung cancer. Finding out that the person has a positive chest x-ray does not increase the probability of being fatigued. It only would increase it because it makes lung cancer more probable, which would make fatigue more probable. But we already know the person has lung cancer. 
So if these are causal relationships, we would expect that this variable fatigue would be independent of these two non-descendants given its parents bronchitis and lung cancer, which is what the Markov condition says. Let's look at another variable. Here's a positive chest x-ray. Lung cancer, out of all these variables, the only one that actually causes a positive chest x-ray. But chest x-ray is not independent of the other variables. And this is something that um, is, is, is not immediately obvious unless you really create a Bayesian network and look at this whole matter graphically. It's, it's, more, it's somewhat obvious that smoking history makes a positive chest ray, x-ray more likely because it makes lung cancer more likely, which makes chest x-ray more likely. But what is not so obvious to people is bronchitis actually makes a positive chest x-ray more likely <clears throat> because bronchitis increases the probability that the patient smokes, which increases the probability that the patient has lung cancer, which in turn increases the probability of positive chest x-ray. So although bronchitis does not cause a positive X, chest x-ray, it does make one more probable. And so if, and in reverse, if you have a positive chest x-ray, it makes it likely you have lung cancer, which makes it likely you smoke, which makes it more likely you have bronchitis. So there are these chains in causal graphs, which become somewhat intuitive and obvious once you draw it as a causal graph. But now let's get back to the Markov condition. Once I know the patient has lung cancer, I instantiate the parents of positive chest x-ray, these variables no longer have any probabilistic effect. Smoking doesn't make it more likely you have a positive chest x-ray. It only made it more likely because it made it more likely you have lung cancer, but we already know you have lung cancer. Once we know the person has bronchitis, it makes it likely they smoke, but that doesn't make lung cancer any more likely because we already know the person has lung cancer. So we would expect a positive chest x-ray to be independent of these other variables conditional on lung cancer, which is what the Markov condition said. So again, let me reiterate how Bayesian networks were often created before we learned, could learn something about from data. They were created by experts who created causal graphs, and then all we needed to do was to ascertain either from data or from the expert these conditional probability distributions and we would be representing the joint probability distribution of all the variables succinctly by the Bayesian network. ProMedis, called Probabilistic Medical Diagnostic Advisory System, is a diagnostic decision support system used in healthcare. The computer program was generated by research groups of SNN Adaptive Intelligent University on the medical center in, in, in Utrecht, so in the Netherlands. Prometis produces a differential diagnosis using a set of patient findings, such as history data, physical findings, and laboratory data. For each diagnosis, Prometis suggests additional tests that be performed to make the differential diagnosis more precise. Prometis is perhaps the, the largest Bayesian network used in the clinical domain. Here's an example of Prometis. This is a small subset of all the variables in Prometis and, and the Bayesian network representing them. You can see that being a sushi, <laughs> this seems odd at first, but it does make sense, because sushi chefs, it turns out, are more likely to have lung flukes, all right? But the prior probability of being a, a sushi chef is very small. Nigeria is also more likely to make you have lung flukes but the prior probability of visiting Nigeria is very small. All right, and then there's a lot of other variables in this, and you can look at them in your leisure hours. Here's a cough. All five of these variables have an effect on a cough. If you have a strep in infection, you're likely to have a cough. If you have this condition, which I don't even know what it is, you're more likely to have a cough. If, if you have uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, of course, you're more likely to have a cough. So this network represents all the causal relationships among the variables that, that we are observing. It's a large Bayesian network in each of these. What's actually shown here are the prior probability distributions. But those are obtained from specifying the conditional probability distribution of each node given values of its parents. 
Here I've instantiated some of the variables in Prometheus to show you what we're going to be talking about this next time, how to do inference in a Bayesian network. Um, that'll be the next talk. But the Bayesian network by itself, it doesn't have much value unless you can use it to learn something about the current patient. And you use that by doing inference, which is you use Bayesian network inference algorithms. You instantiate various nodes to, to, to true or false with these, these nodes or whatever, if they're not binary, other values of them, and then see what effect this has on the other variables. Here we know this person is a sushi chef. We know the person visited Nigeria. We know they have pain. We know they have above normal temperature. We know they're coughing. And we know they have a double, above normal white blood cell. You can look at these other variables. Now it becomes 65% likely that you do have lung flukes. Before, it was almost impossible with lung flukes. So see, by, by developing this Bayesian network and then using a Bayesian network inference algorithm, which we will discuss next time, we are able to, based upon these symptoms, learn the likelihood of, of variables of interest, namely a disease variable such as lung flukes. All right, that's the end of this talk. Like I say, the next talk will concern inference in the Bayesian network, which I've alluded to with those last two slides.